Hello again everyone, this is the second video on this art tutorial. In this video I'm going to explain some methods in R for statistical analysis. The first part is going to be on images and graphs and then on hypothesis testing. Okay, when we do, when we use R, and I showed this in the first video, we can do some very quick exploration using the plotting function in R. However, they they are nice for a quick and dirty work, but you know they are not nice looking, and the amount of things you can do on them is somewhat limited when compared to the ggplot. So that's why I'm going to dive in this tutorial a little bit more in the ggplot functions. I'm going to use uh, data frames that are uh, already included in R, so they are part of the R um, programming language base. So we have, for example, MT cars, pressure, faithful, and tooth growth. If you want to get into more details about R, uh, about R and graphs, I recommend you that you look in this book. And if you want a lot of um, information advanced about advanced plots and how to create nice looking plots, you should take a look on this one. Okay, cool. So let's start where we are with things that we already know. We already saw scatter plots, and I already showed in the last video about the ggplot2 and scatter plots. We're using the same the data set I'm showing here. So this is somewhat familiar, so I'm going to move on to the next part. Okay, so if you want in the scatter plot, we are just showing line points. What if you want to show lines as well? Well, it's quite easy to do that in R. We call the ggplot as before, and using the data set different now, the pressure, we set x as the temperature, y as the pressure. So as we expected, with higher temperature, more pressure. Um, for lines, we just call the gym, gym line. And because we want also the points, we do use this plus sign and put a point. So to make things a little bit different, I add some color. In this case, I put it in red. If you run, you're going to see that as we expected, as we increase the temperature, we have higher pressure. The line is very interesting, and the points, as I showed, as I told you, are going to be in red, while the lines, uh, the line is in black. You can change, for example, and say, okay, I want a blue point instead of a red point. I don't like red. So yeah, there you go. You can do the same for the line. So let's make it like this, and there we go. You can play with this as much as you like. I'm not a big fan of this, however, so yeah, like that is okay for me. Okay, so one nice thing about a ggplot that you can use, one nice feature, is the histogram. I'm going to show it using the tooth growth data, and it measures the effects of vitamin C and tooth growth in guinea pigs. I've heard that some of you like pigs a lot, so maybe you're going to enjoy this. Although I think guinea pigs are not like the sort of pig that uh, you were talking about. But yeah, coming back. Let's see how an histogram is. It's like this. Okay, so the ggplot on the tooth growth, the data, I'm showing just the length because on histogram we are measuring the frequency of the x variable. So length in this case. We are showing the histogram. So instead of geom points or geom lines, geom histogram. We set this parameter to the width of our beam. So for example, this is this is the width. If we set it to two, we could make it bigger or smaller. I mean, filling the bars with white and the borders with black. I could change to make it blue. I don't like it, but I'm going to show you here how it works. But yeah, very ugly. We can also change the width of the beam. Sometimes you want a higher width. And yeah, there you go. Maybe it's the granularity is not so good, but yeah, it keep giving you a clear idea that the um, most cases are around 20. When you have it with two, we have a more detailed information, which sometimes can be too detailed. This depends on the data, so sorry, but you are going to have to explore it um, every single time. Okay, in some cases, we might prefer a smooth version of the histogram. And this is simply simple. Uh, for that, we can call the kernel density estimation, estimates the density of the of the variables that we have, the density of the length. We do the same call as before. 
with the density code. And this alpha here is just to make things nice. So let's see, and I'll talk about alpha later. So we have a density of the, the length of the tooth growth in terms of density, so it goes to 0 to 1. Everything has to sum to 1. If you change the alpha here, for example, to 9, it will become more blue. And I don't like it, so yeah, 2, 0 0.2. It becomes a little bit purple, and I like it more. Yeah, nice. But what if we want both? We want the density because the density tells some information, some, but it's an estimation. So, so we also want the histogram to show the, the real data. We can do we can do that with a little bit of a little trick. The y values for the density curve are small because they are scaled between zero and one. However, the histogram matches the amount of counts, so we have to do. A little bit of trick, a little trick, and set y to be this dot dot density dot dot, as it is, it is here. And then we can call the histogram and the density functions, as we did before, using the same things all over again. And yeah, there we go. We have the density estimation, we have the histogram, all together. Maybe that's what you want to show. That's nice. Okay, so in this data set, they are measuring how much of, uh, what is the impact of different supplementation, like vitamin C or juice, in the impact of the, uh, the tooth growth length. So maybe you want to separate, okay, I want to see the current, the, the histogram, but only for vitamin C, and then only for juice, but on the same, same image. So same call, call as before. Histogram again, same call as before, but I'm adding this new part here, where it is going to separate everything else in terms of the supplementation. So this is this tile here is a formula that tells, okay, I want this given those. I want supplementation given everything else. So that's the only difference, supplementation. And there you go. Histograms given orange juice or vitamin C, vitamin C uh, supplementation types, the histograms are different, they have probably a different impact. Okay, nice, cool. What about density functions? Can we do that and separate them in different, given the different supplementation? Yes. However, the, the function call is a little bit different. In this case, we call the fill, uh, filling with the supplementation here, so there is no extra call, but we extended this a little bit. We call it the geo density as before, and now if I put here three different colors, we see the estimation in greenish for the vitamin C and pinkish, pinkish for the orange juice. You can see that they are somewhat different, likely to be um, where you can see that the orange juice leads to higher growth than vitamin C, which is a very surprise to me. Okay, now let's put everything together. Density, estimation, given different supplementation type. GG function call, data set, we want the length. The trick for density, we want to the fill the supplementation type. Our geo histogram, I'm going to enter here. As before, the geo density as before, and because we we are separated histogram in grids, we call this as well. So we have the fill for the density, the face grid for the histogram. And there you go. I think it's very useful and tells a nice story. You can get to know the histograms and uh, densities for both different groups. Okay, one uh, another type of uh, statistical tool that ggplot offers us is the box plot. They show the distribution of continuous variables. Um, it visualizes five different statistics: the median, the hinges, and the two whiskers, whiskers, and also all outlying points individually. So let's see. Keeping the tooth growth, I want to check the interaction, so different types of supplementation, given the dosage, more dosage, less dosage. Still looking at the length, and yeah, geon, plots, geon box plot, because that's what we want. And there you go. This is the, those are the, the, the box plot. Orange juice with half dosage, and vitamin C with half dosage, it's lower, leads to lower length growth than, for example, orange juice with a higher dosage as well as vitamin C with a higher dosage. You can see that they grow, so lower dosage and higher dosage, the different type of dosage have an impact. Orange juice is the best for those two, but here is the same. 
we can annotate. I'm not going to get into the cold details. I find I think that you can explore this later. The annotate function is quite nice because you can put some information on the graph. So, so this figure is the same as before, but now I'm annotating on it. I'm showing, for example, that the this black line that all box plots have shows the mean. The the line on top of it, of the box plot, showed the that 75% uh, of the data is below it. While the, this line here shows the only 25% of the data is uh, uh, below it. So above it, we have the rest. Here we have 50, 75 and only 25 here above. And the outliers, as I said, are show individually. So the annotate function is very nice. It can show information on the graph that we can use to Simplify the, understand more of the, the understanding of the, the, the image we are showing. To finalize this section on graphs, I'm going to tell you some ways that I like to improve graphs. The first one is to use the team minimum. I'm going to show the box plots as I was showing before, and using the team minimum that simplifies the amount of information we receive. Also, I'm going to, to, give, to put some colors on the data on the box plots. And they call it, they, they say that these are blind color color friendly so let's go with it and there you go i think this is much nicer to look at and because it calls a lot of attention to the box spots and not to the background another way to improve the the graphs are to rename the x and y axis and add some title this is useful to so that you can give more information in case you in case you forgot to tell so the text goes here, box plot of the interaction between supplement type and those. I can also, for example, use the backslash n to break lines, which is very useful. And yeah, I find it this very nice to look at. So now I'm going to move to the next topic, which is hypothesis testing. When we are doing hypothesis testing, we have the new and, uh, hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The new hypothesis is the default assumption. Uh, and we are, well, the thing is about, about it is that we are trying to show that it's false. On the other hand, the alternative, as the name tells, we want it states the opposite of the new hypothesis. Okay, cool. So how do we do hypothesis testing in R? We do using the... Okay, we have this student's t-test. It's one of the most statistically used methods for hypothesis testing. And... To show how does it, it work in R, I'm going to create some um, simulated data using the R norm function. If you want more information, you can just run the code here. And you see, like, we have four functions here. The R norm is the random generation for the normal distribution with mean equal to mean, so zero, and standard deviation equals to one. We can change the values, but I keep as the as it is. Of course, if you want more information, you can look at it, you look at the documentation, it's quite useful. Okay, so in this case, we want to test, for example, if the datas are different. We know that they are not, because we are simply for the same distribution, but just for the sake of explainability. So our new hypothesis is that the simulation data are equal. We use the t-test and compare those 20 values, 10 for x, 10 for y. And yeah, here we have the, the results. We find the p-value being bigger than our alpha. So we can re we have to reject the alternative hypothesis and then accept the new hypothesis and, and consider that the data are statistically similar. Well, this is, is, is expected since both were drawn for the same distribution. So the, the student test should give this result. We also get an extra information that you, if you like to talk about it, for example, the confidence interval and the means distribution. Okay, cool. So we tested the uh, two different data using the t-test, but what if you want to test data that are from different distributions? For that, I sample 10 values with the norm, again, and then 10 values using the Poisson distribution with lambda equals to true. Since they are different distributions, the t-test should tell us that. Let's see if it does. Okay, so in this case, the p-value we found was very low, lower than our alpha. So we can tell that there is statistical difference between the data. And we can also have information about the confidence interval. 
So we reject the new hypothesis and consider the data to be statistically different. Well, this is again expected because they are from these different distributions. So there is no surprise here. So yeah, this is how you use the t-test and how you can interpret a little bit of the output. But generally, because you're going to, this is not how you're going to use the, the t-test with not this interface I just show, showed you. Why? Because likely we will compare data for a data frame we imported when we loaded the data into R. I'm going to create a simulated version of a data frame, but most important thing is the last line here in this code chunk. Um, I'm using the same um, ex example as before, normal 10 normal data for from normal distribution. Um, I create the data frame, I change the column so it becomes nice and smooth, data in one column, distribution on the other. For the x distribution I'm calling normal 1, for the y distribution I'm calling normal 2. You won't need to do this when we're reporting the data, but since I'm creating just fake data here, yep, yeah, I'm defining some more things. When I do like this, um, the data frame converts the x values into factors, and this is not good when we want to do. Uh, this is not the factors are not numbers, so we want them to be numbers. So we change the factors into numbers like this, and we apply using the most common interface in R, which is function. Yeah, the most common interface for this kind of testing, which is function, data that you are interested, formula, and grouping, which groups you want to look. So again, yeah, we find higher p-value, yeah, no, no surprise, they are for the same distribution. I want to call the attention here for the styled um, formula thing that is very important because it's, I think it's not something that you are familiar with. So generally the idea is you use with the tiled and f for the formula. The idea is you use the values you want to explore, tiled the grouping, so how you want to combine it. So in this case, we wanted to get the data and combine given the distribution. And then we do the testing. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the second test, uh, the second hypothesis test that we did before between norm and Poisson create a data frame, x is normal, Poisson, z is Poisson, distribution, changing the names so it becomes very nice, the column names, converting from factor to, to numeric the data values, and using this new interface. So that you can see that now again, lower p-value, yeah, the distributions are different, statistically different. Okay, sometimes we want to compare more than just two um, means so we use that the ANOVA. It stands for analysis of variance and compare the variation of data within groups with the overall variation of the data. Um, it's a generalization of the t-test so you can it's like doing t-test but with more than just two means. So here I'm going to give an example of the number of breaks in yours which is some sort of um, thing that you use when you are knitting or you're creating some clothes and I want to see if there is some relation in the number of breaks given type of wool and give the amount of tension so less tension or more tension because we have two types of wools different types of, of tension we can use the t-test to have more than just two means so we use ANOVA but the idea is the same. Our new hypothesis is that the combinations don't break, don't lead to different in breaks. That is that they all have the same mean. So yeah, uh, we are going to run ANOVA, which stands for this function. If you want more information, we can just remember, call the documentation. We want to see if we have some impact in terms of break, given the woo and the tension. And the data set is the warp breaks. We call summary on the uh, on the return output of the function, and we see how it goes. Okay, so for this data set and situation, we find that different types of wool have a, do not lead to a difference in terms of um, do not have statistically significant difference. So di all types the same amount of break. However, for tension, on the other hand, we have a, a lower value. So we found statistical difference for the tension type. 
After we do the ANOVA, we can further ex uh, explore the results using the Turkey HSD test to show confidence intervals of the differences between the means. It's a post hoc comparison on each factor in our ANOVA model. Okay, we repeat the, the ANOVA call, but then we process it using the Turkey HSD function. And there you go. Okay, so let me explain what we found here. You look at the p-adjust column, we find that with medium and high tension, high p-value, so no statistical difference. Low and high, uh, p-value is low, so um, lower and high tension has some statistical difference as well as low and medium tension. So both of the output of the function, so the output of the function show there is no difference, uh, this statistical difference between weaving with high and medium levels of tensions when compared to low levels. So if low levels there is difference, high and medium there is no much difference. We can also explore the results as a figure here. So we can see, we look at the dashed line, we see that the confidence intervals are not crossing the line. Statis statistical difference, if it crosses the line, statistical difference. So those are ways of doing, those are nice ways of doing hypothesis testing in R. And I showed here the two most common methods for hypothesis testing, the t-test and the ANOVA. So thank you very much for your attention here and I'll end this video.